I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. Got a Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 24. We're digging in, we're digging into the resurrection. I'm just so thankful that you are here this morning, that you have made the time to be here. And my prayer for us at this moment that you would just allow the Lord just to be free from distraction. Let's just focus in for the next few moments. I promise you, if you don't know who I am, I promise you I am very efficient and we'll be very efficient this morning. So all of the activities, all that is potentially trying to distract you and occupy your mind, everything from the masters to the ham you're about to be eating later on, remove it, okay? Just for the next few moments, lock in with me because the Lord wants to do something incredibly special and miraculous in every one of us and corporately together this morning as we come face to face with the reality of the resurrection because we have to ask that clear, easy question, simple is it true? I mean, is it true? I mean, if it's true, then, I mean, something's got to change. But the question is, is it true? I mean, if, out of the honor of God's word, the tradition here at Highview is to stand in the honor of God's word. So if you're able and willing, I'd ask for you to stand. We're going to begin in Luke 24, beginning in verse number one. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Pray with me this morning, please. Lord Jesus, Lord, we just humbly come before you in your word, and Lord, may you show us clearly who you are, Lord, remove anything that keeps us from you, any form of unbelief or rebellion or distraction. Lord Jesus, we just pray you remove it all. Lord, may we truly know you this morning, be changed by you. Lord, we know we were made for you. And Lord, may you do a miraculous work in us. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. We begin with obviously the very first Sunday morning and that day when the women who prepared those spices to go to minister to the body of the Lord came to that tomb and the stone was rolled away and it was empty. And there they met two angels who communicated to them, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Just as he told you was going to happen. And they remembered And with great joy and excitement, they ran back to their gathering up there in that upper room. They're all hiding out and they go and they tell all the other apostles and disciples exactly what the angels had told them. I mean, they just had an amazing, miraculous, supernatural experience and they are pouring out their heart to everyone around them. And in that moment, verse number 11, but these words seem to them an idle tale. And they did not believe them. And that's maybe where you are this morning. I mean, who knows? Why are you walked in here today? Did you walk in here out of joy, excitement? Did you walk in here out of obligation? I've been there. I've done that. 
Have you ever had mom put the pressure on you? I've had mom put the pressure on me and walking into church, not wanting to be there. And you're thinking, why am I listening to this preacher? Why would I want to believe anything this guy has to say? It all seems like a myth to me. It's a fairy tale. It can't possibly be real. I mean, that's exactly their reaction. That was the reaction of the disciples. It was a reaction of those who had walked with Jesus. I mean, that's the realness of the scripture. I mean, they are being honest with themselves. They are communicating. They didn't even believe themselves. But verse number 12, but Peter. Something stirred up in Peter. Peter rose and ran to the tomb. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling. And what happened? Man, that's not strong enough because if you know the story of Peter, do you remember the story of Peter? Do you remember just a couple days ago, right at the crucifixion on, before, on that Good Friday, he had denied Jesus. He told him he wasn't gonna do it, but he denied Jesus three times. And so Peter running to that tomb, there must've been excitement and there must've been trepidation. Think about this for a moment. If it's true, if Jesus is alive, That means I have to face my past. That means I have to face my failures. I've got to look him in the eye and remember my sin. And there's some of us in this room, we don't want Jesus to be real. If Jesus is real, that means my life has to change. And I don't want to change my life. Like, I want to do it the way I want to do it. I don't want to be under someone else's rule and reign. But that is not the case. The case is that we are the creation. He is the creator. We were made for him. And sometimes meeting him is hard. This date, 23 years ago, April the 9th of 2000, I had to come face to face with Jesus. And it wasn't easy. Some of you may know this story. Some of you know that at that moment, I was a church planner in Philly. Highview had sent up 100 kids. We had gone blitzing door to door, 14,000 door hangers. We were trying to start a church in Philadelphia. I mean, a tough city. I mean, April the 9th of 2000 was gonna be our very first service. And I woke up that morning and there was two inches of snow on the ground and it was coming down like a blizzard. And man, I was giving it to God in the backyard of that little house that I was renting. And I was like, are you kidding me right now? Like, I'm a missionary. You may not know this, but like, we're having our first service today and there's a blizzard going on. And I mean, I was so upset. I was so mad that I went upstairs into my quiet time. You ever got that one of those those angry quiet times where you're turning into the Bible and you're like, oh yeah, what do you got to say today, Lord? You know what I'm saying? And all of a sudden the Lord in that morning took me to Job chapter 38. You ever been there? In that moment, God begins to question Job and says, Job, I'm gonna question you. You gird gird yourself up like a man. Have you ever created the dawn to rise? And it took four chapters of God hammering Job, four chapters of God hammering me and basically saying, Aaron, this is not your church. And it's gonna be done the way I want it done. That's a moment of meeting the Lord Jesus in a way that you really don't wanna meet him because that means there has to be a moment of surrender. Some of you who are here this morning, you are coming in here and you don't want to meet Jesus because you know the things that are about to happen. That's Peter. Peter knows that, man, if Jesus is for real, if he really is alive, he's going to have to come face to face with his failure. And what's going to happen in that? What's Jesus going to say? What's he going to point out? What's he going to do? Because we're all guilty. And here comes then from this moment, There comes two guys on the road to Emmaus and Lord Jesus meets them upon the way and then he opens up the scriptures to them and then he disappears when he breaks the bread and they are so like excited that in the middle of the night they run back to Jerusalem to communicate all that the Lord has appeared to them and they find out that the Lord has already appeared to Peter. That's where we pick up the story in verse number 36. As they were talking about these things, all the events that had taken place, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. Jesus himself stood among them. I mean, you talk about a frightening moment. You talk about a life-changing, trembling moment. They're talking about all these events. They're getting pumped up. They're getting excited. And then all of a sudden, he's standing right in front of them. And he announces to them, peace to you. 
Remember that he is the great conqueror. Remember that he is the victor. Remember that he has just defeated sin and death. They all fled from him. And he announces to them peace, salvation. He's welcoming them in. He's not showing up and he's not giving it to them. I would have gave it to him. I mean, if I'm showing up, I'm just defeated sin and death. I'm just the greatest victor and they all fled from me. I'm pointing out, I told you, didn't you guys listen to me? I mean, like I would have given it to them. Just, what, do you feel that with me? I mean, I would have given it to them, but the Lord doesn't. He welcomes us in. He had every right to chastise them. He had every right to point out all their, their negativity, all of their failures. And he doesn't. He extends to them grace. He welcomes them in. And remember, please don't forget who he is. According to Romans 16, 20, this jumped out to me when we were studying the book of Romans. It says in verse number 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He is the God of peace and he has the ability and the authority to extend peace. Why? Because he's the God of peace. He owns it. It belongs to him. And he, out of his gracefulness and his mercy, extends to us all of that grace and mercy and welcome us in. Man, take a look at their reaction, verse number 37. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that is I myself, Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have anything, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Here comes the reality of Jesus, the realness of Jesus. He shows up in their midst, obviously, as they have the same reaction we would have, terrified, we're frightened. We think we're seeing a ghost, but he says, no, 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 it's me. It's, I'm here in the flesh and bone. Look at my hands and look at my feet. Why would he show this hands and his feet? Why? Because he still carried the marks of the cross. That's where the nails were put through. Even though he has a new resurrected body, he's still carrying the marks of his great sacrifice. And he shows them his hands and his feet and he allows them to touch him and to see it. And he points out, man, I know there's disbelief in your, in your life. I know there's disbelief in your heart, but he's still welcoming us in. Like he's not pushing us away. He's welcoming us. There's a patient, gracious evidence of our Lord in the realness of who he is. And even in the midst of their still disbelieving, he asked for them for something to eat. And what do they give him? A piece of broiled fish. Are you kidding me right now? Like a broiled fish? Like, is there something better that you have than that? But he eats it in front of them to show his realness. That's what you have to come to face to face. That's what you have to come to grips with. Jesus is alive. Jesus is real. He has defeated sin and death. And because of that, Every promise of God finds their yes in Jesus. Every word that he's ever spoken has to be true. And you now have to allow the Lord to evaluate every decision in your life and realize we belong to him. The question is, will you surrender? Or will you remain in your rebellion, remain in your disbelief? Or will you actually surrender to him? Because the Lord brings gifts. I mean, when you surrender to him, he brings gifts. I want you to take a see them, beginning in verse number 44. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Here's a gift. The gift that he gives us is the gift of God's word. There's a description that is used here in describing the Old Testament that he's talking about the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. That's how the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament was separated. That's how it was put together. That's how it was described. So what he's saying is that the fullness, the totality of the Old Testament speaks directly to me. And so he's placing a tremendous authority upon the word of God. We have the privilege of knowing our Lord in and through his word. There's not some kind of spiritual elitism that we have to have some type of crazy experience with the Lord. No, it's in and through his word 
that he reveals himself, that he speaks to us, that he draws us near, and we're able to see the fullness of Christ in every aspect of Scripture. J.C. Rao writes this. It's kind of long, but hang with me on this. He says, Christ was the substance of every Old Testament sacrifice ordained in the law of Moses. Christ was the true deliverer and king of whom all the judges and deliverers in Jewish history were types. Christ was the coming prophet greater than Moses, whose glorious coming filled the pages of the prophets. Christ was the true seed of the woman who was to bruise the serpent's head. He's the true sanctuary to whom the people were to be gathered, the true scapegoat, the true bronze serpent, the true lamb to which every daily offering pointed, the true high priest of whom every descendant of Aaron was a figure. Don't miss this though. Let it be a settled principle in our minds when reading the Bible that Christ is the central light of all its books. So long as we keep him in view, we will never greatly err in our search for spiritual knowledge. Once we lose sight of Christ, we will find the whole Bible dark and full of difficulty. The key to understanding the Bible is Jesus Christ. He brings this gift of unlocking God's word. I mean, if you don't know him, then the Bible is just some ordinary book and you're reading it and you're not understanding any of it. But in Christ He opens up your mind. That is a gift that he blesses us with and he shows us who he actually is in the fullness of God's word, that it is living and active, that he is revealing himself, that we can know him in and through his word. That's what he's doing with the disciples. He's bringing the gift of God's word and the gift of opening it up to us in and through Christ. He continues on and he says in verse number 46, and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. That he is pointing out all the way through the Old Testament and he's pointing out that all the series of events that had just taken place, that they were there for a reason. That he willingly laid down his life. That he has the power to take it up again. He knew all that he had to accomplish and he accomplished it so that we might be rescued and delivered from bondage. And to be free. I mean, that's why he came. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came for us. Why? Because we have a price over our head because of our rebellion, because of our sin. That's why the next gift that is mentioned is life changing. Take a look in the scripture. Look at verse number 47. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Here is a gift that you can experience right here, right now, and it's called repentance and the forgiveness of sins in his name, in the name of Jesus. Why? Because he has come from us, come for us because he has paid our price upon the cross. He lived the life that we should have lived, that which separated us from God. He came to remove and to remove that sin and to remove that which keeps us from him. He came for us and paid our price and he sacrificed himself and then defeated that sin and death in and through the resurrection. That's why there's power in the resurrection and that power, come on, you can clap it up people. You know, I get rolling and you start clapping and you start distracting me, but I'm going to go anyway. Here we go. But with it, realize that with that power that the Lord stirs up within us, this gift, and it's called conviction. And something may be stirring up within you right now. And that repentance is a confessing of sin and a turning to Christ. That's what repentance means. And then there's this beautiful gift called forgiveness where he literally washes us anew. I want you to hear that. Every one of us in this room are sinners. Every one of us have made mistakes. Every one of us have tremendous amounts of shame. Man, if your life was just played for us upon the screen, including myself, guess what? We would never come back. But our Lord Jesus receives us fully and has the power to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we ask him, he came to seek us. He came to save us. And we saw, we see this even upon the cross. 
Man, I want you to turn back over to Luke chapter 23 and the thief on the cross up on the screen here for you. It says, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed justly for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. A famous pastor named Alistair Begg tells a fantastic illustration on this particular section of scripture and kind of putting ourselves in the place of that thief on the cross when events happen and take place and his death happens and he shows up before heaven. Can you imagine? He goes, can you imagine that moment? This guy shows up to heaven and the angel is standing there at the door of heaven saying, who, who are you? Like, like, what are you doing here? Like, why should I let you in? And he's like, I have no idea. And he's like, well, what do, you, well, what do you know about church membership? What, like, what do you know about the doctrine of justification? What do you know about anything? He goes, man, I don't know anything. All I know is that guy on the middle cross said I could be welcomed here. That's Jesus. He has the authority to welcome us when none of us have any reason to be welcomed. We've not earned it. There's no one here who can earn salvation. No one here can be good enough. You cannot do enough good deeds. No one can earn their way to heaven. It is only in the authority of the name of Jesus and the forgiveness of sin that he places upon us that we are welcome into his kingdom. Do you understand the great gift that the Lord brings? He brings salvation. He brings redemption. He brings restoration to us, not based upon our good works, but based upon his grace. And because of his great grace, he does not leave us where we are. He changes us. Take a look in the scriptures. Come back to verse number 47. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. That's a brand new title placed upon the disciples. Brand new, never been given before. They are now witnesses, meaning they've had a firsthand account. They've experienced the Lord. They know who he is. They believe in the resurrection. And now the Lord is commissioning them. He's sending them. He's changing them. He's giving them a purpose. He's giving them a future. He's changing their very lives. He does not just leave us where we are. He radically changes who we are. When you follow the Lord Jesus, there's a change that takes place. There's a newness that takes place. That whole phrase, some of you may have heard this, being born again, meaning the old has passed and the new has come. That's legit, man. That's real. That's meaning the Lord Jesus. That's experiencing him and being changed by him in such a way where your thoughts are different. Your desires are different. Your decisions are different. And man, you now understand that you are made for a purpose and you are now on mission with the Lord. You are now a witness beginning Where? beginning in Jerusalem, beginning in the very place, that dark place where the Lord was just betrayed. Think about the grace of our Lord. He was just betrayed. He was just, had all these events take place within Jerusalem. And he says, go there first. Share the good news. Man, our Lord wants us to know him. He wants us to experience him, but he doesn't leave us alone. Take a look at verse 49. Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. What is Jesus talking about? What gift is he talking about? He's talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the gift of the presence of God upon us. I mean, one of the details that really jumped out to me this year in reading the crucifixion accounts was the one detail that kept jumping out to me, and that is that when Jesus was crucified, he, when he cries out, it is finished, that the veil was rent in two from the top to the bottom. You may not know this, but that veil, that veil was there covering what a place was called the Holy of Holies within the temple. It was covering the place where the presence of God resided upon the Ark of the Covenant, and no one was allowed to enter. You entered into that place, you immediately died. Only one man, the high priest, was allowed to enter in once a year to offer a sacrifice for the, all the people, and it was closed off. But when Jesus was crucified, it says that the veil was rent from the top to the bottom. Do you understand that that veil was 20 feet wide, 60 feet tall, and it was four inches thick? And so that means no human being could have torn that. 
that Lord miraculously torn it to make a clear statement and a truth, and that is the presence of God is no longer located in a particular place in the city of Jerusalem. The presence of God has now been unleashed upon his people to fulfill the great promise that he will be our God, we will be his people, that he will dwell in the, within the midst of us. We now have direct access to the Lord. The presence of God himself, the Holy Spirit, is now placed upon his people. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit, and now we can talk and walk and be used by the power of God for his kingdom and his glory. Think about that. That's the life change that I'm talking about. But do you believe? I mean, do you actually believe that Jesus is real? The disciples struggled, but the Lord overcame their unbelief. He showed himself to them. Man, ask the Lord, show yourself to me, Jesus. Show me who you are. Open my heart. Open my eyes to who you are. I mean, I'm telling you, the Lord is gracious. He will show himself to you, and he will welcome you in. And you will experience the great gifts of his word and the clarity of his word. You will experience the gift of the forgiveness of sins. You will experience the gift of being transformed into his witness, and you will experience the gift the presence of God that can never be taken from you. You literally will be made new. Are you ready to take that step? Are you ready to believe? According to Romans 10, 9, it says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The resurrection is a life-changing moment, not just for Jesus, it's for you. He extends his victory to you. Will you walk in his victory? Pray with me this morning, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you that you gave us a clear eyewitness account of your resurrection. You are alive and you have all authority and power to forgive us. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, where are you with the Lord? If you're honest, where are you? Do you know him? If you don't, man, I know the Lord. I know the way he works. And I know there's some of you right now, there's something stirring up within you. You can't even explain it, but there's something stirring up within you and you just, you yearn to confess your sin. You yearn to call upon the name of Jesus. You know there's something in your heart. You know this is true. You can't even explain it, but you know it's true. He is true. And he's inviting you in. Will you confess your sin? Will you proclaim his name? Will you believe Will you trust him? The scripture says, if you trust him, you confess with your mouth. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Jesus is calling your name. Lord, give us the strength this morning to respond. Give us the strength and the faith this morning to believe and truly be saved. Father, do what only you can do. Bring your salvation. Change us, Lord. Change the way we think. Change our thoughts. Change everything about who we are, Lord, for your glory and your kingdom. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.